Well, after so many dark and sad talks, I would like to start with something which is more optimistic. It's a sentence from Adam Smith, uh, who said, how selfish, soever men may be supposed, there are evidently some principle in his nature which interest in him in the fortune of others and render their happiness necessary to him, though he derives nothing from it except the pleasure of seeing it. So that seems to be a bit in contrast with what we heard today. It implies that there is a principle that's using a term which now probably is out of fashion, I would say a mechanism. There is a mechanism which somehow render us, I would say good, but anyway interested in the positive aspect of others. Well, in my talk, I will try to demonstrate that these mechanisms exist, indeed exist. And one of many things which happens and horrible things that we heard today is due to the fact that the social, the culture, the ideology can destroy or, however, diminish this mechanism. So this mechanism is, is the mirror mechanism. And uh, before describing it, I have to spend a few words on physiology, because not everybody here, I think, knows uh, this point. So we started our study not looking for mirror mechanisms, but simply studying the motor system. And we used an approach which was a bit different from the classical one. So instead of studying velocity, acceleration, dynamics of muscle, and so on, we studied the behavior of the monkey in a theological condition. So we presented food to him, we looked at how the monkey was reacting, how she was eating, and so on. And that was a very fruitful thing, because we found, first of all, that in the motor system, there is a large number of, of neurons which do not respond to movement, but to motor act. Motor act is a term which has been invented by Michael Arbib, and it implies that you have several movements organized in such a way to reach a goal. So we introduce the term of goal. So the motor system is not organized to produce movement, but to produce goal, which eventually determine movement. Here you see a monkey which grasps with the mouth, with the right hand, with the left hand. These small dots are action potential. And you see that in all three cases, there is a strong discharge. When she grasps it with the mouth, the muscles are completely different, of course. So that's implied that uh, action, it's a motor act, it's encoded. Then we did another experiment which was asked from us in order to reinforce the enforcement, and so we uh, the statement, and so we used normal pliers and reverse pliers. With normal pliers, you grasp an object closing the hand, with reverse pliers, opening the hand. And look here, in both cases, the histogram corresponds to moment in which the action was accomplish it. It doesn't matter if you open, if you close. The histogram in one case uh, is on the sending part of the uh, lower part of graphs, in the other in the ascending part. The other big surprise was that there were plenty of visual neurons in the motor cortex. One category that we studied with Hideo Sakata uh, imply how we grasp an object. It's a transformation of the object affordances in the movement, in the shape in the hand, but today that's not important. But then there was the second category of neurons, which was quite surprising, because that's in my old uh, picture. The same neuron, the same motor neuron, which fired when the monkey grasped an object, fired when the monkey observed another person grasping it. It could be a human being, it could be another monkey. So there was this congruence between what you produce and what you see. So you have this strange connection. Here is the same thing for the mouth. Here it's even more complicated because the movement of monkey, when grass food in the mouth or one of his sucks, it's very similar and the discharge is only for grasping, and the same it was the experimenter grasped food with the mouth, or instead was drinking from a syringe. Now I show you a movie, very simple. What you have to do, I hope that then I will manage to provide you with the sound. 
it's very simple. You have to correlate what the monkey does with the action potential sound. Tuck, tuck, tuck. That's the action potential, the language of, of neurons. You have to correlate the language of neurons with what the monkey is doing, and then with what the experimenter is doing. I hope that you will hear that the room is small. Can you hear? It's a grasping neuron. Mirror effect, same neuron. like a dialogue. So I think this film explains everything about mirror neurons. You see that the same action is active when the monkey is performing, when one the experimenter is doing. The goal is there, because one the Fogassi, who was the actor here, grasped it with the mouth, was the same meaning like grasping with the hand, and there was a discharge. And finally, you don't need specific analysis or histogram or analysis, you, you see there. Of course, you can do much better, you will see. But anyway, this is the way in which you can understand immediately what's going on. So why? The, the issue here, of course, the curiosity, the issue was why the motor system should be active when we have, I don't know how many visual areas. At the time when we discovered there were 17, I think, I don't know, many. Well, I here I think the best answer has been given by Marc Genero. Marc Genero was really the pioneer in the idea that the motor system is very important for cognition. And Mark wrote uh, in 204, a mere visual perception without involvement of the motor system would only provide a description of the visible aspect of the movement, but it would not give precise information about the intrinsic component of the observed action, which are critical for understanding. So in order to understand an action made by another person, you must have a kind of motor replica of what he is doing. Of course, also for imitation and so on. I think that point was very well written. Mark was also a very good writer. He wrote several very nice books. Well, we tested this. We tested this by using a very simple way to provide other mm, sensory modalities. So one can say, well, this neuron is just a visual neuron. No, it's not a visual neuron. It's a neuron which explains you what the monkey is doing. So we did another experiment in which we showed first to the monkey, uh, the experimenter was breaking a sheet of paper in two pieces, full vision, and there is a nice charge. That's the mirror effect, uh, classical mirror effect. Second experiment was to put a barrier, an opaque barrier, so the experiment the theory sheet of paper into pieces, but there was only sound. So the monkey can see anything, but yet there is a discharge. So the neuron uh, signaled what was going on, although the monkey cannot see. And here is control, which is only sound, white noise. Well, Everybody has similar experience. If you are in your room and you hear somebody walking outside the door, you understand that he's walking. For the monkey, it's the same when you break a peanuts or a piece of paper and so on. And here, I mentioned before that I don't like very much uh, statistical analysis, but this paper will be published on science that ask it, of course, population analysis, sound, and so on. But you see exactly the same thing. If you look at the third row, S, there are 39 neurons and the blue, line indicate the sound which triggered the neuron, and he read other sounds which were very poorly effective. 
Now, at this point, we have a lot of success. The people say, oh, mirror neurons, when they fire, you understand the things. As a matter of fact, it's not true. The mirror neurons simply translate sensory representation into motor representation. And this motor representation is present not only in the premotor cortex, but as shown by Roger Lemon, Kraskov, and the group in London, in Oxford, in London, in University College. There are neurons which are mirror, have mirror properties, although they are corticospinal tract neurons. So the phenomenon which start in the premotor cortex then ignite all the pattern of motor activity. So we have in our brain a motor schema exactly as when we do the action. Uh, the group of uh, Roger Lemon also described that there are mirror neurons in the corticospinal tract, which have the opposite effect. So when you, the monkey does, there is a discharge. When the monkey sees, there is inhibition. And he interpreted as a kind of mechanism which modulates when you want to emit it in action or when you don't want to do it. Well, since the time is running, I will show you very fast this experiment in fMRI in monkey that we carried out in Leuven together with uh, Diorman and Ellison and the other people. Uh, in Leuven, they have been very clever because they put the monkey in a box and train it to fixate a point. And the monkey has simply to detect when the point changes intensity. In this way, the monkey, after uh, she was rewarded in this case, the monkey learned to stay in the box. At this point, they put the monkey in the real scanner, and they can use just the normal clinical scanner, very cheap, and, well, that's what we did. So I went to Leuven, and I will show you just, since the time is short, I will show you the final result. That has been done with Trey Tesla and indicate the circuit of mirror neurons which start in STS, the area which has been very nicely studied by David Parrott. Then it goes to the parietal lobe where there is plenty of mirror neurons both in area AIP and PFG and then it reaches the premotor cortex. I look at the three areas which are involved, STS, uh, parietal lobe, and the frontal lobe. Because experimenting humans, which we carried immediately after those in monkeys, show that the same area are involved. But I prefer to show you a, a meta-analysis, which has been done in uh, Urich by Carl Zilles and his student, Carl Zilles is the best anatomist we have in Europe. And look what it, it resulted from this meta-analysis. That is based on 99 patients, 99 cases, and you see there is activation in STS, in the parietal lobe, and in premotor cortex. So the same circuit which we discovered in the monkey is present in humans. Well, the other thing, it's true that the goal is represented also in humans. Well, we did an experiment in which we presented either action made by hand or by a robotic hand. Robotic hand have a kinematics, which is completely different from humans, and also the shape is, of course, different. Well, apparently it's the same thing, so the goal is there. The goal is present in both cases. But you see this arrow indicate that when it's a human action done, we have an activation of the left inferior parietal lobule. And with Giorban, we repeated this experiment with several instruments, and it's selective for the inferior parietal lobule. Why it is important? Because other people, like Johnson Frey, for example, show it, that when you do movement with the hand, uh, pantomime, an instrument or using an instrument, you have an activation of that. So we understand the action made with tool because we have the same copy. And in neurology, it's well known that lesion of the left inferior parietal lobe determine one of the aspects of idiomotor apraxia, so the difficulty in using tools. Well, now something very new. Uh, I am really very fond of this technique of stereo EEG. Stereo EEG has a big, enormous advantage on fMRI. Uh, 
It's very difficult because you must have a good surgeon, you must have a good center, you must collaborate with them. But the advantage is, is enormous. The first uh, fMRI, as in most cases, just described the bold, so the blood flow and the vein, the disposition of vein, artery, can give you results which are not very precise. In this case, you record from the real neurons. You record from the, the electrodes are inside the brain. The other thing, which is even more important, is the time. Because we are so used to fMRI, we are so happy when it appeared, that everybody practically has forgotten that time is an extremely important factor in our capacity to understand what the others are doing. So we have a kind of some blobs, and we think that this is the area, but we don't know in which order they have been activated. What is their importance? With this test system, we can do it. Here I just mentioned it in red, uh, Lorusso, which is the head of the Center of Neurosurgery in uh, Niguarda, specialized for surgery on epileptic patients. And Ivana Sartori is a neurologist who tested many of these patients before then we did the neurophysiological experiment. Well. Uh, the technique, I said, it's rather difficult. We, here we have an expert in this technique, but anyway, just a few words. We insert electrodes which can record from the shaft. So simultaneously, one can record from 10 points. And in addition, they put 16 electrodes, typically, in a certain region of the brain, according to where they suspect is the epileptic uh, focus. So. The advantage, in one patient, we have 16 electrodes by 10 uh, uh, recording points, so 160 points from one patient. If you have 10 or 20 patients, practically you have the whole brain. Uh, I will show only one experiment, which is based on that. You present, look at the lower low. There is an object, an instrument is going, and then it's... Uh, the instrument uh, grasp the object. So we synchronize it, the gamma activity on onset, on entry, and on contact. And now, I hope you see the color. The black color are those points in the brain which are uh, synchronized with the beginning. The gamma appears when you present the stimulus. The important thing is the red. The red stuff is the mirror mechanism for action. You see its activation of the parietal lobe. It includes very strongly the inferior parietal lobule, which is not present when you do by hand, and also the premotor cortex. The surprise was that we have blue points. The blue points in one, the hand was in contact with the object. Remember that that's not an action, it's observation of the action. So when you observe an action, you don't have only two blobs in the premotor and parietal lobe, but you have a sequence of events which start in the occipital lobe, go to the parietal, to the premotor. And recently, that's not published yet, we are just working on it. Pietro Vanzini is especially working on it. So if you look in terms of time, you have first the occipital lobe, then the mirror system, and the last is the tool. So when I see somebody doing this action, I understand first what he's doing, then it's how he's doing. It's a film of the action. Well, again, my, some of my colleagues were very enthusiastic and say, well, mirror neuron explain everything, which is not true. Here it's a nice experiment, which I did with Buccino. That's a fMRI experiment. We are back to history, a fMRI experiment. And we presented to a student lying in the scanner either a student biting or the monkey biting or the dog biting. Second part of the experiment, they saw the, the student reading, but no sound. So the, the, the student in the scanner could recognize only the deep reading. The monkey was making a figurative gesture, lip smacking, and the dog was barking. So two set of experiments, one in which the behavior of the three species is present in their motor repertoire, the other no. And here is the result. Look at biting, look at the left hemisphere, which the hemisphere for action is practically the same. So when I see a monkey biting, or I see biting a dog, I map on myself. I tend to humanize this being, and I think that it's like me. 
but it's not true when I see what is uh, typical of a species. So lipridic activating humans, the brocasare and other are related to language, but look at the dog barking activate only the occipital lobe, but you ask the subject, well, what, what was doing the dog barking? So how they understand it? By making inferential thinking. So we have two ways, that's very important, will be more important with emotion, but it's very important already now. So we have two ways to understand the other people, like me, or not like me. So the dog, when it's biting, it seems like me. That's why the people so like the dog. They are so similar to us. But when he's barking, it's completely different. It's not like me. It's another, another being. And by the way, try to yourself what means barking. We don't know. We can imitate the sound, but all the internal stuff, what the dog has inside when he's barking, we don't know. Well, that's what we call it with Corrado Sinigaglia, the philosopher with whom I wrote a book, Understanding Others from Inside. But now I, let's move to another center, because the mirror me mechanism, it's a mechanism. It's not a system for recognizing some action, but it's a mechanism. It's present in birds, for example, for, for singing. It has been demonstrated by the group of Isaac in the hippocampus and the SMA, the work with Muhammad and Jacoboni. But let's look at the insula. We worked with the insula recently, and we studied this behavior, which is not commonly studied. What is the difference between the two actions? It's the same action, stop. But it's how its performance is different, even more clear here. The girl is giving. Well, I think the probability the first couple will survive and the second not is very high. <laughs> well, this type of behavior has been called vitality forms by Daniel Stern. Daniel Stern is a great psychologist and psychanalyst, uh, died recently. In 1985, he wrote a beautiful book uh, about the relation between mother and child. And he introduced this term, which in neuroscience has been practically ignored. Vitality form is very important. So we studied it with uh, one of my students. The first experiment, we contrasted how with what. And we found that if you contrast that, how, so vitality form, activate a part of the insula, selectively a part of the insula. Then he did many experiments. In one experiment, the subject is lying in the scanner and either observe this action, made in a gentle or in a rude way, or make motor imagery. Motor imagery a la Genero. He thinks that he's doing the thing. Execution in the limit of fMRI, he does this movement in a gentle or a rude way. Now, that doesn't matter, it's the cortex. Look at this section. In all conditions, we have an activation of the insula. This yellow spot, in imagination, it's very clear. The yellow spot, without any other thing, it's produced by motor imagery. Then we did something which is common in fMRI study, conjunction analysis, and you can see that for root, for gentle, and also for control. Control is still have some vitality form because it's a human being doing something, so you cannot eliminate it at all. And exactly now we know, making some study, it's in correspondence of the second and third uh, short gyri in the insula, just in, not the first one, the second, the third. But now let's go back to, oh, by the way, somebody told me, well, but insula does not produce movement. So what, what you are saying? It's nonsense. Well, we look at, at the anatomy in the monkey, and you can see here that if you inject in the action circuit in the motor cortex, you have an activation of the central part of the insula. Well, in another experiment, I am back now to the monkey. In the monkey, we stimulate the insula, and we discover that there is a, a very complicated structure. Put your attention in B. In B, there are color. One is big red, and one is blue. 
Now I will show you what happens if we stimulate with a prolonged uh, uh, stimulation, like uh, Graziano did in the motor cortex, a monkey. So please look at the, right, at the red light, which will appear from time to time. Chewing. Red light. Red light. Well, now I move ventrally to the blue part. Red light. It's not happy, something, something bad. Red light. She's looking at this food. Ah, disgust. Again. So every time when we activate this part of the insula, the ventral part of the insula, the monkey is unhappy. It's disgusted. Now we reinforce the behavior of the monkey. Red light, surprise. She look at it and say, how, how it's possible? It was so good one moment ago, now it's so bad. Well, this is the monkey, but there is a meta-analysis, again from Ulrich, in which they show it, it's the ventral part of the insula, which is related to emotion. The dorsal part, it's more cold, let's say. Well, we have a nice data, not our, from my group, but from other people, which demonstrate that if you have a lesion selective of the ventral part of the insula, the patient still recognizes fear, anger, but not disgust. Colder, and then also adults. There is also a very nice an anecdote in which somebody well, put on the, on the floor something disgusting. And then they ask it to the patient, what do you think about that? He said, delicious. So the, the incapacity to dis distinguish is full. But now, what happens when you have MRI? That's an experiment which I did with Bruno Vicker and Christian Kaiser and also Vittorio Galese. And the experiment was done in the following way. We injected in the nose, they injected in Marseille, by the way, the experiment has been done in Marseille, odorants. And the odorants could be pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. The best one, and those I will talk today, it's rotten eggs. If you inject rotten eggs in somebody, everybody feels disgust. And what happens in the brain? In the brain happens that you, you have an activation of the ventral part of the insula. Look at B, this red spot are the activation produced by disgust and odorant. Well, second part of the experiment, instead of presenting uh, natural stimuli, we presented social stimuli, a face which can be pleasant or showing disgust. And here are the important part of this experiment. We, we demonstrate that there is a set of voxels which are activated by both, by natural stimulus and by social stimulus. This is not trivial at all, because what it means, if the same voxel is activated when I have a natural stimulus and I have another stimulus, it means that your emotion, in this case disgust, is like my. So you and I became we, because your disgust is my disgust. And Tanya Zinger, who is there, demonstrated the same thing for pain. With, with pain, there is a big discussion because people said it's not a real emotion and so on. But anyway, the data is there. So for pain, we have the same. So, but you see the importance. It means that we can recognize the action, emotional action of others by our system for our action. We can, of course, recognize uh, emotion by, in, by inferential thinking. If you read a newspaper that 20 people has died, has been killed in Afghanistan, of course you are not happy. 
but you don't have any reaction in your heart. If you look at your pupil, they don't dilate. So we have two ways of understanding others. One, considering them like me, and the other, consider them as things. The important point why here it's important in this meeting is that these mechanisms are plastic. You can modify them. They are not fixed. So now imagine that you have somebody or somehow which modifies this mechanism which say, she is like me. What, what will happen? Well, imagine the policeman. The special corps, they beat the people, they see blood, but they continue to do it. They feel the emotion. The empathy is there. They recognize for sure that there is blood there, and, but they have been trained to ignore it. And to make something less dramatic, a surgeon. A surgeon go in the surgical room and cut the patient, see the blood, but nothing happens. He's used to it. Uh, it's interesting that typically the surgeon never operates some of their family because in, in this case the emotion will be very strong and probably they will be bad as surgeon. Well, that's example which are sociologically I think very simple. But now think about ideology. I am very happy that Berger before explained these mechanisms which can modify a country. And the example I want to do is Germany in the 20s. Why Germany? Germany, because Germany was one of the most advanced countries in the world. Is the country of Goethe, of Schiller, of Beethoven, of many scientists. So it's not just a tribe in Libya in which only Obama thinks that if he send away Gaddafi will be a democracy. It was a really solid country with a lot of tradition in science. So how it happens, then in 20 years, a group of people convinced a part of population, of course not all of population, that some people, like Jewish, were untermenschen, or something wrong for... Well, if you think now, we heard before all these factors, what happened in Germany? They lost the war. You have to say why you lost the war, because it's a proud country. It's not used to, to lose wars. So what a group of people decide, and there is other thing, was inflation, the uncertainty about the future. So you, you, you have to come out from that situation. And somebody like Goebbels was a genius of propaganda. He had no, <laughs> had no uh, internet, but he had radio. And with radio, you can convince it. I, I remember when I was a boy, still the old people especially said, oh, the radio said that something happened. It's true. Now nobody believes the journalists. But at the time, it, it, was, it was, that was the, the, the. So Goebbels was able to convince a people, very, very civilized like Germans, that a group of population was untermenschen, and they are very bad. They caused the war, but if you convince them, that they are not like me. That's why I showed you the monkey and the human. You are like me or you are not like me. If you are like me, I cannot kill you. There are many points that you say, no, I cannot do anything. But if you are not like me, if you are a kind of animal, let's say, well, nothing strange. A particularly normal people can do it because it's convinced that he's not doing something. It's not a murder. It's something... Normal, like we can kill a, a cow, doesn't matter. And of course, it's very difficult to come out from this situation. Now we heard that then there is a contagion, that there are people, there was a question by Edmund Rawls about suggestionability, he called hypnosis. But there is part of population which is strongly prone to be suggest to suggestion. So it became a kind of thing you know, from which is very difficult. I, I, I spoke about Germany, but the film that we saw today is terrible. And uh, although it's not Germany, it's not Europe, but still I think the civilization in Syria was present many years ago. Well, so I think that the basis of all horror that we heard before is the dehumanization. 
there is a sentence by Buber who said that the important thing that you consider the other people not like an object, but like a human being. That's the fundamental thing. When this is lost, then you can find many explanations. Of course, I am speaking about normal people. I don't speak about psychopaths, which may have a lesion or frontal lobe or other part. That's normal people, which can behave this way. I don't think it's necessary to look for psychopaths. And one day people say, Yes, uh, I, I just obeyed to the order. They, they are sincere because there was no. If somebody tell me to, to, to destroy the tree there, I go there. I don't feel any guilty for that. Well, I, I, I almost finished, but I am very proud of our data in. I uh, know, ah, well, two things. This point, which I mentioned it before, is something which has been understood, I think, by that from Leviticus. Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. That's from the Bible. So who is religious will say, well, that God said. Who is not religious will say they were very good in saying the, 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 the ethical rule for the society using the religion. Well, I stop here. <laughs>